Here we go. We are picking up from the last part the top 31 games I first played in 2014. If you didn't have the patience to sit through all 31 entries, then this will be a short version. This will be a top 10. And if you do have the patience, then this will be part 2 to the list. The same rules apply as in part 1, and there can be more than one game per franchise. So, now it's time to finish this up. I want to admit this. I haven't gotten into the Dynasty Warriors franchise. Don't kill me, Josh! I'm just more into Nintendo-based games. And yes, I'm entitled to playing whatever I want to play. Anyways, if you haven't guessed, I'm talking about Hyrule Warriors. I love how this type of gameplay mixes with the Zelda universe. Your goal is to go throughout the battlefield defeating a bunch of enemies at once. So satisfying. And solving certain missions. You do stuff like defeating enemy captains and taking their bases, and if the opponents damage your base enough times, you'll lose. Some missions require you to escort some characters. Their AI is stupid. They take forever to go where they're supposed to go, and instead just attack a bunch of enemies, but defending them isn't all that bad. For most of the time. But it wouldn't hurt to throw in some Oracle, Phantom Hourglass, and Spirit Trek references. But that aside, Hyrule Warriors is epic. There are two reasons why I didn't get Sonic Lost World in 2013. One, because I was too busy with other new games, and two, because I mostly play games in franchise order of the day they come out, and I hadn't played Sonic Generations at the time. Lost World got hate because, one, it's a Mario Galaxy ripoff. So because it shares one similar element that automatically makes it a Mario Galaxy ripoff. Let alone when this mechanic has been used in games before Mario Galaxy. That makes perfect sense. The other reason is that the controls are a bit off. I got used to them after a while. I like the villains, known as the Deadly Six. I do like their different personalities. Lost World isn't as outstanding as Sonic Colors, yet the level variety is bigger, and some levels that aren't as common in video games. A Dragon level, a Sweets level, and a Honeycomb level. The Wisps are cool, just not as much of a blast as they initially were. The returning ones are good, but the newer ones are awkward when trying to control them. Lost World may not be as phenomenal as modern Sonic games like Adventure, Unleashed, and Colors, but I love the game. For a while, I wanted a sequel to Yoshi's Island. Last year, Yoshi's New Island came out, and it was very fun, yet it wasn't what it could have been. Not only did it not fix some of Yoshi's Island DS's mistakes, but also had more flaws in it. I took out the museum and there's only one set of secret levels instead of two. On top of that, Red X no longer makes stars when they hit wing clouds, only when they hit enemies. And what happened to those cool icons that appeared on the levels when you selected them? To me, New Island's biggest flaws are the intro and ending, but does the rest of New Island make up for that? Yep. Like one reviewer said, Yoshi's New Island fails to innovate, but never to charm. It also introduces two new types of eggs. The giant egg wrecks havoc on the overworld, and the metal egg dozer rolls on the ground and also allows for underwater travel. And believe it or not, the water controls aren't half bad. There is no excuse for how you start with only 10 stars every time you die, no matter how many stars you had before you hit the middle ring, but there's one thing it does much better. Now if you want to get 100%, you don't have to get all the flowers, red coins, and stars in one run through. There's the opportunity to get them in different run-throughs, so the player can get all the stars in one run-through, and not even care about them in the next run-through. The bosses don't necessarily live up to their creativity of the past two games, but they're still creative. Heck, the poorly designed ones have a charm to them. Except for the final boss. The soundtrack does have a few bad songs, but the rest of the soundtrack is quite nice. Some people say that this game is too easy. Well then, try some of the extra levels and then talk to me about easy. Was it worth the wait? Not entirely, and I see why people hate it, but this game entertains me. Pokey Park Wii Pikachu's Adventure is a very cute game. The music and art style of Pokey Park Wii are both adorable. You play as Pikachu, and your way of befriending Pokemon by playing with them is quite entertaining. The minigames are also very addicting to play through, and the different zones are also very colorful. 
Not much else to say about Pokey Park Wii, and I can't explain why it's this high. Maybe it's just because this is a personal experience, but it's very cute. I would have gotten Final Fantasy 4 in 2013, but since it was also titled Final Fantasy 2 for some stupid reason, I didn't want to risk spending money on a game I already have. Then I realized that it's a different game. I got it, and I'm glad I did. Final Fantasy 4 has a wider variety of levels than the previous Final Fantasy games, and traveling to the underworld, and now there are some mountain trails. They're amazing to climb, and one flaw with the dungeons in the series is you can't save during them. But here, the dungeons have save points. You can also use these save points to bring out tents to heal you up. And, unlike some games, Final Fantasy IV has magic restoring items and Phoenix Downs available in stores. And you can have five playable party members in the battle at the same time. While Final Fantasy V brought in a few improvements, I believe Final Fantasy IV has better music and a better storyline. Some characters will switch in and out of the party. The only thing that would bug me is that when, spoiler alert, Sometimes the party member is gone for good, and the time you took to leveling them up will go to waste. But I won't allow that to get in the way of loving the game. Donkey Kong Country Returns was Donkey Kong's triumphant return to the classic formula of the Donkey Kong Country series. But I felt like something was missing. Okay, not just the Kremlings, but something else was missing. Then, Tropical Freeze came out and totally blew my expectations. Returns had arguably the most creative level design ever. Tropical Freeze has better level design than that. I didn't think it was possible. A buzzsaw that cuts up parts of the tracks and launches them ahead of you as obstacles, and fruit being cut up and flung into the air to use as platforms. In Tropical Freeze, you not only pair up with Diddy Kong, but Dixie and Cranky too. Diddy Kong crosses large gaps with his rocket barrel like in the last game, Dixie Kong can use her ponytail to fly higher, and Cranky Kong bounces by using his cane as a pogo stick to cross spiked floors. It also has underwater levels that don't stink! The visuals show how beautiful the Wii U's graphics can be. And the rocket barrel sections are more fair because now the controls are a bit better. And now they can take two hits instead of one! Tropical Freeze, in my mind, is better than Returns, and better than the SNES trilogy. The only complaint I have is that it suffers from difficulty overkill at times, but not to the point of making me rage quit. Except for some of the temple levels. When Generation 6 was announced in 2013, that made me worry that they weren't going to make Generation 3 remakes, but then they got announced in 2014. There are improvements, but also a lot of things they could have handled much better. Now there are only 6 trick houses as opposed to 8, there are almost never any trainers in them, they didn't include the ability to have double battles as a result of two people seeing at the same time like Emerald did, New Marvel is pretty much nothing compared to how it used to be, running through piles of soot isn't nearly as fun as running in the grass to see where you've been, which I know was done to keep the flute thing from taking too quickly, they could have at least made it require more soot, and they removed the battle frontier! Sure, we have the Battle Mason, which I almost never found myself going to, and we even have a statue of the Battle Frontier, which makes me feel like the game is maliciously mocking us for the fact that we can't challenge the Battle Frontier with its new features, whether they mean to or not. Some see this as a teaser for DLC, but I don't want to get my hopes up. I only see it as, oh yeah, we know you want the Battle Frontier, but we're not going to give it to you. These games are amazing, but they're just not the same. That being said, they brought in a lot of improvements. Better camera angles, while some Elite Four members now have newly evolved Pokemon, such as Phoebe using Dustnor and Glacia using Frostlass. Some areas look much different than they initially did. Granite Cave now has a giant mural displaying a drawing of the legendary Pokemon. The Cave of Origin now takes you to the very core of the Earth. The Team Aqua hideout now looks like a pirate cove. The Magma hideout has those lava pipe things. And now Marvel City looks like a giant shopping mall. I'm also very proud that they made new Mega Evolutions like Mega Sceptile, Mega Swampert, Mega Metagross, etc. They also worked on the enemy teams by giving them an additional Pokemon for them to use. Wally's Gardevoir is now replaced with Gallade. I was hoping he'd have one because of how fitting it would be. And making him a second rival without overshadowing your other rival. Speaking of your other rival, your rival's Pokemon are finally fully evolved in the fourth fight. Heck, your rival acts like somewhat of a love interest. 
So for the people who are in love with Mei, now people can finally think of her as a girlfriend. Well, in a video game, but you get the point. Heck, after you defeat the Elite Four, some trainers registered in your PokéNav have some new Pokémon matchups from the Hoenn Dex. Even some of the random trainer NPCs. And once you get the Eon Flute, you can fly to any route you want, no matter who you have on your team at the moment. And Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire seem more story-based now, and a post-game with the Delta episode. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire just bring back so many memories, and even though they didn't use their full potential, the stuff they did make them this high on the list. I have been waiting half a decade for Super Smash Bros. 4. After years of having dreams about playing Smash 4 only to wake up and be disappointed to find out that it was just a dream, it came out. And it paid off. Of course, everyone should know why, but I'll explain anyway. 53 playable characters! They went from 12, to 25, to 35, to 53, and we don't even have all of them yet! And customizable movesets just in case you're tired of your moves being exactly the same, Whenever you play as a specific character. But there are some things I like in the other games better. I like target tests much more than target blast because I liked it better when you could seek out the targets in the maze. And I really liked the subspace emissary because it was my favorite part of Brawl. My favorite part of the 3DS version would be Smash Run. Though it's 3DS exclusive, it's like the city trial from Kirby Air Ride. The 3DS version was okay, but the Wii U version is worlds better. I preferred Smash Run's exploration over the Smash Tour, and yet the Wii U game has better visuals when compared to the 3DS version, and the soundtrack is one of the largest in gaming history. Some returning songs from previous games, and new compositions, and more than 40 playable stages. On the other hand, the stage builder isn't as cool as it was because there aren't as many parts to it, and I kinda would prefer it if they just made the Wii U version and didn't make the 3DS version, because we lost the Ice Climbers thing to it, and Zelda and Sheik are now separate characters, which I think is stupid. But Classic Mode has redeemed itself because the encounters are more randomized once again, so it's not the normal repetitive run every time. I don't know if it's better than Brawl or not, but it's definitely an awesome game. My gosh, Chrono Trigger is better than Final Fantasy IV in my opinion. You can go in diagonal directions as opposed to just up, down, left, and right. The player can switch out your party members, and after a party member leaves, they come back eventually. That's a great step upward. The soundtrack is more outstanding. I like it even more than Final Fantasy IV's soundtrack. Probably my favorite soundtrack in the Super Nintendo library. The storyline is also brilliant. You go to five different time periods. Your goal is to defeat Lavos and save the future. In the future, Lavos has destroyed the world, and in the year 2300, you even see what's left of the world after it was destroyed. That's quite dark. Chrono Trigger is a masterpiece, and my new favorite Super Nintendo game, because it's aged so greatly. And you can face Lavos at different points in the game to get opportunities for different endings, which is very creative. But this game would have had a chance of being number one if one of them wasn't the worst video game cutscene ever! But that's the only thing that ticks me off in the game. Everything else is pure epicness. Alright, now that I am close to finishing this countdown, I'm going to recap the bottom 30 before I get to my number one favorite game that I first played in 2014. Number 31, The Ultimate Test of Patience. Number 30, Not For Me. Number 29, Super Castlevania 4. Number 28, Sonic and the Black Knight. Number 27, Final Fantasy V. Number 26, Pokemon Stadium 2. Number 25, Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. Number 24, Mario Party 3. Number 23, Mega Man 5. Number 22, Mega Man 4. Number 21, Sonic Generations. Number 20, Kirby Triple Deluxe. Number 19, Sonic Rush. Number 18, Sonic Rush Adventure. Number 17, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Number 16, Risky's Revenge. Number 15, All Stars Racing Transformed. Number 14, Pirate Curse. Number 13, Treasure Tracker. Number 12, Sonic Advance 2. Number 11, Sonic Advance 3. Number 10, Hyrule Warriors. Number 9, Sonic Lost World. Number 8, Yoshi's New Island. Number 7, Poke Park Wii Pikachu's Adventure. Number 6, Final Fantasy 4. Number 5, Tropical Freeze. 
Number four, Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Number three, Smash Brothers 4. And number two, Chrono Trigger. Like I said in an earlier countdown, the Mario Kart series seemed to get better and better with each game for most of the time. Case in point, Mario Kart 8. Easily my favorite game in the Mario Kart series so far. The graphics are so beautiful, they give Super Mario 3D World's graphics some competition. I was immediately dazzled by the layouts of almost each level in the game first time I saw them, both the old and new levels. The older levels are now completely revamped with some modern elements and breathtaking designs that make me feel like I'm looking at a completely different level and still getting nostalgic throwbacks. The higher difficulty settings also manage to find a balance between challenging and fair. Mario Kart 8 also has the awesome zero gravity thing letting you drive up walls at times, and the level layouts are so epic. And thanks to the new DLC, Mario Kart 8 now dethrones Mario Kart Super Circuit with the most tracks out of any Mario Kart game so far. Mario Kart 8 has the basic types of levels and 9 of the 10 underused levels from my underused levels list. An amusement park level, an autumn level, at least part of a track is one, a Chinese level, a clock level, a farm level, a highway level, a train level, a sweets level, and a toy level. However, the battle mode stinks now. Rather than having unique battle courses like the other Mario Kart games, they just reuse some regular tracks and try to pass them off as battle courses, but fail at them. It's apparently because they want people not to suspect when someone appears from around a corner, but that doesn't excuse it. It's entertaining seeking out your opponents for the first time, but gets dull after a few rounds. And the first DLC package was very disappointing. From a game that brought us tracks like Cloud Tap Cruise and Toad Harbor, this DLC's retro tracks had tracks that were already brought back in previous installments in the series. This would be okay if they actually had differences, and the newer ones weren't all that special. Tracks like Mute City and Dragon Driftway were good, but tracks like Excite Bike Arena and Hyrule Circuit struck me as lame. The Excite Bike Arena had a layout that could easily be made in Mario Kart 64 as a custom stage by fans. But what about the Hyrule Circuit? That's where my next problem comes in. The inclusion of Link. To many people it's a good addition, but to me, I don't like it. I mean, giving the Hero of Time a spot in a Mario Kart game? Could that be any more out of place? That's like giving Winnie the Pooh a gun! Thankfully, the second pack made up for that. Sure, it brought us some already brought back tracks like Baby Park, but I liked them over the ones in the first pack because they felt different from their original counterparts. And Cheeseland and Ribbon Road are even more revamped than the tracks that were already brought back in Mario Kart 8 before the DLC. It literally makes me feel like I'm playing a completely new track! Mario Kart 8 is easily my favorite in the Mario Kart series so far. It was a very close decision between Mario Kart 8 and Smash 4, but eventually the decision was made and I eventually had to go with my gut and say that I think this is the game that deserves its spot as my number one favorite game that I first played in 2014.